So again, we want to thank Dakota Supply Group for sponsoring the recording of today's sessions. Um, again, for those board members who couldn't make it, if they if they want to uh, catch up on our training, the sessions will be available um, on our YouTube page at North Dakota Water. Um, as we have heard a little bit today, water drainage issues issues have become a big part of water resource district's duties with increased involvement from the legislature, um, especially this year. Our session this afternoon will fo focus on water management from producer and transportation perspectives, um, ending with a deep dive into the updates uh, made by the legislature um, in tile drainage this spring. So right now, um, Please help me uh, welcome Levi Otis from Ellingson Companies and Cliff Isendor, a producer from Botno County, as they talk about their their topic, um, which is titled A Look from the Field. Levi Otis has been with Ellingson since 2014, serving as the Director of Governance, excuse me, Government and Public Policy. His primary focus revolves around representing and protecting landowners' rights with an emphasis on agricultural water quality. He works with local, state, and federal governments, assisting in the establishment and corporate strategies, policies, and plans, which align with government laws and regulations throughout the United States. This work includes extensive work with NRCS and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Wildlife. Um, Cliff Isendorf is a producer and currently serves on the Botno County Water Resource District Board. He's also a member of the Service River Joint Board uh, the Northwest Water Supply Authority, and the North Dakota Water Resource Districts Association. Um, all right, so please help me welcome Levi and Cliff. Good afternoon. I was kind of glad when I saw the uh, schedule that I got you guys on the backside of lunch, so we tamed down a little bit. But um, I was also happy to see how many people I know here. I, I grew up in Devil's Lake, and Dwayne Ash and my buddy Jeff Frith back there, I've, they've known me since I was a little kid and, and gotten to work with a lot of you guys around, uh, around the state over the years. And, um, it's nice to uh, come to a friend, friendly room on a busy week. So um, today, a, a water management, a look from the field. So when I was given the, the title of what we're going to be talking about, I, I thought maybe, maybe it's good for you to understand where the contractors come from, what we look at going into a tile project, and what we try to work with our farmers or producers or or uh, landowners, absentee landowners who want to improve their ground and improve the production with drain tile um, and the steps that go into it. Um, some of you obviously are customers of ours, so you, you probably know it, um, but I don't think it hurts to, to get a little refresher course and, and uh, there's a little method to our madness. So if you indulge me, we'll, uh, we'll move forward. Um, is this thing one? And we can go from there if that works for you guys. All right, so contact information. Yeah, you better be slow. I hope you don't run the battle. <laughs> <laughs> they do not let me sit in a tile pile. Once in a while for a pretty picture. I'll just let Jack do it. So anyway, my, my contact information, I put it on the, the first or second slide just so I'm, you'll see it again, but I'm not afraid of phone calls and, and working and talking through things. So I, I prefer or hope that uh, if there's ever questions or concerns that you guys reach out and we're able to uh, uh, visit about it. So 
here's the Egg Drainage 101 video. I, I like to share it every single time as a refresher of exactly what we're doing when Welcome we're putting in tile. Welcome to Agricultural Water Management 101 by Prinsco. There is no question that the most uncontrollable element in farming is weather. Subsurface water management gives producers an opportunity to regain some control from unpredictable weather. An effective water management system is essential for crops to attain their full potential and maximum yield. It allows for proper soil composition and optimal root development, maximizing plant strength and nutrient uptake. The key visible features of a water management system include the outlet, a ditch or stream to carry excess water away, and a buffer strip to shield the stream from overland soil erosion. As rain enters the system, it is what happens below ground that makes a water management system so valuable. The large diameter pipe is called a main. The job of the main is to take excess water from the field and direct it out of the system. The smaller pipes are called laterals and form a pattern or grid across the field, collecting excess moisture and carrying that water to the main. Laterals are usually spaced 30 to 75 feet apart and are buried two and a half to four feet deep depending on soil type. The main is always deeper than the laterals as water moves through the system using gravity. Water flows to the lowest point, which is always the outlet. Water enters the laterals through small perforations or slits in the pipe. The perforations are designed to allow water in and to keep soil out. From a side view, we see the main. No, the water table is just below the main. A properly designed water management system does not take all the water out of the soil. It manages the water table to keep it at a constant depth, which is usually three to five feet below the soil surface. By managing the water table, the optimal soil profile for plant growth is achieved. The soil profile is the area from the soil surface to two and a half to four feet below. This area is where nutrients are taken up by the plant roots. Ideal soil properties in the profile are 50% minerals and organic matter, 25% air, and 25% water. A cross section of the main reveals the laterals entering, allowing the water to flow downhill into the main. As rain begins above ground, the soil profile is able to accept water from the surface as it filters down. Once the water reaches the perforated laterals, excess water enters the system and begins flowing to the main. Compare that with the same field without a water management system. Typically, the water table is higher with less area available to absorb water. When the soil reaches full saturation and rain continues, excess water cannot soak into the ground. The only place for excess water to go is to flow over land to the lowest point, carrying with it valuable soil and nutrients. This will cause erosion of surface soil, dumping sediment and nutrients into the ditch or stream. A water management system allows more water to be filtered through the soil and less risk of soil erosion. As the soil profile reaches full saturation, the rain ends, excess water filters down to the laterals, into the main, and out of the system through the outlet. This reduces the amount of water in the soil profile. It is important to recall for optimal plant health, 25% of the soil profile should be air. If not, plant roots will be deprived of necessary oxygen and cause plant death. As excess water leaves the main into the ditch or stream, the soil profile continues to take in needed oxygen. Plant roots continue to grow, pushing deeper as the water table retreats. It is critical for young plants to establish deep roots early in life. If the water table is at or near the surface for an extended period of time, plant roots have no need to grow deeper, seeking water. Instead, they form shallow root systems. As the growing season progresses, extended dry weather stresses plants as the shallow roots are unable to turn downward and capture moisture from the retreating water table. By managing the water table, plant roots thrive in an ideal soil profile. Nutrient uptake is maximized and deep roots are established early, benefiting the plant the entire growing season. Inline water control structures are a great addition to a water management system. This unit is installed at the lowest point in the system, usually near the outlet on the main. A water control structure features adjustable stop logs that can be added or removed depending on the time of year and weather conditions. When an extended dry period is anticipated, the stop logs are placed in the structure at a level that will temporarily raise the water table. As water enters the system, it is held in the pipes by leaving additional moisture in the soil profile for thirsty plants. 
When the system is saturated and the pipes are full, excess water flows over the stop logs and through the outlet. Stop logs can be adjusted to hold water in the system, particularly after planting in the spring and prior to extended dry periods throughout the growing season. If excess water conditions are present, stop logs can be removed, allowing water to flow out of the soil profile, especially prior to spring planting and fall harvest. Managing the soil profile with a water management system has tremendous benefits. It is an affordable tool producers can use to directly impact the health of their crops during the growing season. Keep in mind the golden rule of drainage, drain only that which is necessary to ensure trafficability and crop production, and not one drop more. For more information, you can visit us at facebook.com forward slash Prinsco Inc., on Twitter at Prinsco Inc., or on the web at Prinsco.com. All right, I thought that video was like five minutes, felt like 12, but I think it really gave us a, uh, I think it gives a, a really good explanation of, of how tile works and what we're trying to achieve. Um, like the end said, we're trying to drain only which is necessary, not a drop more. Right now with a dry year, you're seeing a lot of guys shut off their pumps, trying to hold water back so the plants use it. Um, that's one thing we try to educate our farmers on doing. All right, so um, I've, I've often hear, oh, why do people tile? What's, what's the benefit? Can't work that well. Um, this picture in front is of Walsh County. Um, this is back in 2014, I believe, uh, going through my files. Um, farmer planted wheat on both sides of his, his road. One had tile, one didn't. And you can see after, after harvest exactly what, what he did the following spring, and that was, that was tile, maybe he tiled it that year. Um, the top left picture is of Harwood, just north of our shop. The interstate is on the left and that frontage road would be um, 81, just on the east side. Um, actually, the, I live in that north quarter, um, northwest, and, and uh, that's, that's kind of what it looks like every spring after plants are, are, are planted. Um, we, all, we see a lot of dirt with, with emerging crops, and those of you on water birds, you obviously know that. And then this was in Norman County, just east of us, uh, the top right. Um, it just, it's incredible when you fly over. Um, I encourage you to do it if you know with anybody with an airplane to get up in, in the early spring after uh, uh, crops have emerged and see really what's going on. It's just unbelievable. So when we stop by the farm and we're talking about tile and if you should do it, what should we do? All right, I've decided I want a tile. What is the first thing that we talk about? Um, do you have a U.S. Fish and Wildlife easement? That is the number one contentious thing that I deal with. And I feel really sorry for those of you that have them because it is a nightmare. Um, the, the map on the left is what we used to receive from U.S. Fish and Wildlife. You probably have it in your track file or or your legal paperwork. Um, some guys haven't seen them, so there's been moments where we're out there tiling and U.S. Fish and Wildlife shows up and says, well, there's easements on this property and the, you know, the farmer didn't know or put it away 30 years ago, whatever. Um, that's, that gets to be dirty. So um, just really rack your brain, it, especially if you're in easement areas. You know, North, Central North Dakota is a, a heavy populated area of, of U.S. Fish and Wildlife easements. And, we, we do not like to be paid to put tile in and then be paid to take it out. It, that turns your $1,000 an acre project into about 2,200 bucks, right? And so a lot of that ground isn't even worth 2,200 bucks. So um, that's, uh, it, that's a big thing. So these are the new maps and I've got the next slide. Um, these are what they were, were sending out and I was just speaking with Kale and, and he thinks they have stopped sending them out. I know the Devil's Lake region uh, Ramsey County, Cavalier. I don't think any of those people received the new maps. Um, so we'll, this is what it, it looks like today. Um, I'll speak louder. So what they came in and they highlighted these areas to get to their, their easement acreage, right? And a lot of those maps are strategically placed. As you can see on this next map, the red is the outline of where we can bring tile to. This is a customer in, in Stutzman County. 
um, you can see basically what he's left to tile. So if a raindrop falls on the inside of that red line, we cannot tile. If it falls on the outside of that red line, we can tile it. Now, U.S. Fish and Wildlife has been a little better with us uh, as long as we tile into it and, and dump water into those areas. They've been working with us a little more. It's not perfect, but I would say the agency has, I better not even say that out loud. <laughs> Every time I say something, they come in with the hammer. So, um, but they have been working with us on this. Um, next, do I have wetlands on the farm, right? So first thing we talk about is U.S. Fish and Wildlife. If you don't, congratulations, we can proceed, right? Um, if I do have wetlands, they're not U.S. Fish and Wildlife easement wetlands. Do I have NRCS wetlands? Yes, okay, let's get our 1026. This one I only use for comic relief because this is a customer down in Lamore County, I wanna say, who got his 1026 back from the uh, uh, NRCS and it happened, his neighbor happened to plow Trump into his farm. So uh, that was kind of funny. So those were the wetlands, he was happy with it. He sent a Snapchat, if any of you know that, social media and said, tile it. So uh, his, uh, it was some com comedic relief for those of us who deal with wetlands. All right, so. Now that we've dealt with the NRCS, we've dealt with US Fish and Wildlife, what are the next questions, okay? We come out and say, all right, where is the outlet? You know your farms better than anybody else, right? Where, what makes the most sense? What's the low area? Where are we going with the water? Which direction is the water flow, okay? Do you get along with that neighbor? Are you going to harm that neighbor, okay? We do not design projects to harm somebody else. Um, in, Kale, I know, talks about reasonable use. Sean, you know reasonable use, right? We do not try to harm anybody. We design and engineer things that are not going to hopefully harm your neighbor. And if you do harm your neighbor, you should pay the penalty. If you unreasonably harm your neighbor, you should pay the penalty. So if they sue you, get out your checkbook, right? And I think that's a misnomer. People think that all oh, tile contractors just wanna go slap, slap in tile and get paid. That is not what we're trying to do. We want to improve the ground and, and improve production and, and keep everybody happy. So once we know where the flow and the outlet are going, we want to say, all right, do we need a pump? Do we, can you gravity outlet? How often is this ditch full? We've got drains in the valley. Um, Cass County knows it really well because we have a lot of big, big mains or big drains that people tile into. Sometimes the guys say, well, I have this big ditch. I don't need, I don't need a lift station. Well, what happens in our spring these, these ditches are all full and they're the last thing to be full. After surface drainage and everything else, these, these ditches are full. Well, your outlet is under the water, so it's not moving the water out of your soil profile like it would with a lift station. So we try to get, educate people on that. Is it some more money? Yes. Does it help you manage your property? Yes. So those are things to think about. Now, if you need a lift station, do you have power? Where is the nearest power source? Are you working with a NODAC or a Cass County Electric or Otter Tail? Who's willing to help you put in power? Some companies charge, some people do it for free, right? And then what's the option? Okay, if your, comp your electric company is gonna charge you to bring power to you, how much is it gonna cost? Do we have generators? Yep, so we have these big cat generators that you can go in and, and fill with diesel and they'll operate your pumps. So those are different things. Um, and then again, public utilities, we wanna be respectful of of uh, right-of-ways and is there gas out there? Is there fiber? So uh, j those are things to think about. Oh, I did it again. All right, so design considerations. What, is it, what are you trying to achieve? Do you hit the low-lying areas, right? Do you wanna just tile the draws? Are you looking at pattern tile? Or do you even wanna go one step further and do subsurface irrigation? What we have found as contractors, especially up here, um, guys want to do spot tiling. They, they feel, okay, that's a low lying area. But then what happens? That becomes their best ground and the rest of their farm that they thought was fine is now their worst ground in that farm. So we end up going back and, and pattern tiling it all. So I'm a big fan of pattern tiling. Depends the ge uh, geographical locations of where you're at in the state, right? Some places it works 
perfectly fine to do with your uh, uh, spot tiling. Subsurface irrigation, I think we've done two projects maybe in North Dakota. Uh, this map actually is a project that we did out in North Carolina for a North Dakota potato farmer right on the ocean. That was pretty cool. Um, but in the bottom corner, we have a, uh, we have a big containment pit. So your, your tile water pours into it and then we pump it back in into the soil profile when it's dry. So it takes a little bit more math and it's usually double the cost, but you use half the water you do in, in pivot irrigation. So it, uh, it works pretty well. All right, so state and county permits. I think most of you are pretty familiar with what's going on um, in the state. And I, <laughs> I talked to Governor Burgum. Uh, he he kind of joked with me that this might have been the first time in the history of water law going back to the Romans that a water law passed with zero no votes in the legislature. <laughs> so I think we went zero in the House and zero in the Senate and he signed it. And uh, I wanna thank Sean and the water board people that you worked with. I know Rich and County was very involved. I appreciate Kale's expertise anytime I call with those kind of questions. And then a lot of the people in this room were very helpful in, in saying what's what's fair, what's fair for the landowner, what's fair for the, the water board. And I know I got sideways with some of our customers talking about landowner rights. You know, if you're going to have water boards, then you have to give them the tools to succeed, right? We cannot have water boards and then strip away all the authority, otherwise just get rid of them. And that, that it does not make sense. So um, I do appreciate all of you that that were uh, helpful and vocal about what we're trying to do in North Dakota and it's grass water law. And, and I think uh, so far everybody's so far everybody's happy. I did get a few calls saying that Levi or Ellingson was pushing this $500 fee. I think $500 is a fair trade off. I didn't say we we're for it. I didn't say we we're against it, but I do on a personal level say, it's not fair for Myrtle on 4th Street to have her taxes pay for a tile project that's 200,000, you know, a tile project's 200 grand and the permit fee is 500 bucks. Is it really fair for Myrtle's taxes to pay for your app your tile fee? I, I think it's a fair trade off of what's going on. So um, I'll stand by that any day. And if it costs the, the water board 500 bucks to, to get the application approved, then it's 500 bucks. If it's 200 bucks, it's 200 bucks. So that's for y'all, you guys to decide your own and your own watersheds of, of what the actual cost is or, or how you want to do it. But there's no heartburn or progression for me. So one more time, there's my contact information. Again, I, I just appreciate always being uh, invited here and uh, getting to visit with most of you folks. I don't see Julie in here, but <laughs> her last name happens to be Ellingson. And I just want to set it clear. If you're mad at me or Ellingson Drainage, don't call her and yell because as far as I know, she's not related to the Ellingson family or myself. So uh, um, I think that's where I'm at. Do you want questions now or do you want Cliff to, to speak and we can handle them together? Or what are you thinking? Okay. And, okay. Yes, sir. I use, I use the general rule of thumb of a thousand bucks, thousand bucks an acre, whether it's buck 60 or, or 80 acres. Uh, historically, they're less than that, but I use a thousand. So I'm not, so if it comes in at 1100, you're not yelling at me, <laughs> but yeah. Recently now um, with resin, so we're having a tr issue getting pipes. So Princo Manufacturing is where we buy most of our pipe. They're a family owned company out of uh, Wilmer, Minnesota, Prinsburg. They've got pipe all, they've got factories all over the country. Um, we do buy some from ADS, like you've seen in Buxton. Um, but the Mexican government got mad at a, at a resin uh, company manufacturing plant down in, in Mexico and they cut off their natural gas. So that started a resin shortage. And then when we had the weather issues in Texas, there were many factories down there. And what happened is it just, you know, is the domino effect. So. Our company, because of the volume that we do, we, we're guaranteed X amount of pipe, um, so we're comfortable. But now as you see, 
uh, corn's tasseling out there. There's I've seen barley already coming off out by War Road. Um, that's going to open up capacity for us. So then, all right, now what are we going to do? Well, we'll be able to put in more projects, but if we can't get pipe, that's going to be a struggle. So this year, I think pipe prices are up 100 bucks an acre is what it's costing us, and we haven't passed any of that along. It's just that's straight material costs. So um, this year it's a little more expensive, but there's no shortage of cash either. Uh, the bankers are bankers around have told us there's a lot of cash in the bank. So we'll see what what happens uh, come this fall. Jesus, you guys are too okay. How much interest are you getting with um, using? A lot. Um, that's, you know, one thing that I, I hope becomes a conversation in the next couple of years. Um, if we could work with the State Water Commission and the State Engineer's Office and be able to start, people are willing to take ground out of production to put up, put up to build ponds and, and then use that water on their pivots. Um, it is a frequent question that we get. But then you run into acre feet of water. How much can you hold back? What does the state allow? Um, and then uh, some guys have, have, are trying to use rivers, right? But now when it, with a year like this, it's probably a good idea not to bring that up if we can pull water out of a river because the cities need them. Um, but yes, that, it's, it is a frequent thing in the last two or three years. It's really been a conversation. Yep, I think you've I think you've got the right idea. Are you, now are you talking about subsurface drainage versus pivots? Okay, yep. So so tr usually it's about half, right? So if you've got a 40 foot center on your your tile lines, then it's a 20 foot center for subsurface irrigation because the water wicks twice as far as it percolates, and that's what we did in that um, North Carolina farm. Um, so. And as far as the ponds go, right? If you're in a nice clay soil, that helps. But then there's also liners that we put down and, and that will contain water until you need it. Yes, sir. What does your company do when you cut across the township road? <laughs> um, well, that's a good question. Usually we get permission, and if we don't, that's an oops on our part, right? And then filling it in. Um, I think historically, and now I'm not a production guy, so I better not get myself in trouble. But, it, right, you bring in the rock and you fill and then come back. And typically it's up to the customer, uh, is my understanding, that comes in and, and fills that in after it, it, it packs in. That's traditionally how we've, we've worked with it. But if that's not happening, then... Again, my contact me. Do you, which, uh, which county are you in, or township? Hanson Township. Hanson? Nansen. Nansen. Well, if you want to write that down, I can follow up with it. Please. Well, you know, you just owe us a load of semi gravel. Load of semi, all right. Got across the road, you know, before everything, you have to go fix the load of gravel. Okay. I, I will look up. If you give me your information, I will follow up. Yes, sir. Yep. Yep. Oh, different tile lines. So sandy soil versus clay, there's a sock that gets put on. So you might see them tile lines that are on semis that have a white. It's basically a sock. And what happens after about five years or so, um, that, that sock biodegrades and, and actually the, the ground cures around the pipe so it doesn't, uh, doesn't filter in. So that's been working well for 50 years. Do they ever flood? Do they ever flood? Oh, if, well, if a tile line pulls apart from the main, we, it, it will fill with sand and then we have to bring a backhoe out and, and get it all cleaned up and put back together. 
So that's about the only time that happens or an open inlet. Um, if you plow dirt into it, that'll do, that will do it. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, actually another division of our company, we do actually do do that. So we have the, the capability to send up uh, long cameras. Um, and I think we've done that maybe on one or two jobs. But sometimes if you don't have like an animal guard right on your outlet, something will crawl up there and die. And you'll, you'll know just by sticking your nose there. Uh, our engineers, it's all on soil type. The University of Minnesota and Princeville got together many years ago, and uh, it, they've got a, what's the ruler I'm trying to think of? The, uh, yeah, the slide rule, right? So if it, obviously your heavier soil, tighter the spacing. So I've got an agronomist over by Hillsboro, um, and we tiled her farm at, at 40 feet, but down, down right next to the river. Um, she's gonna have us come in and, and do it at 20 feet just because it's really heavy right down in there. Yes, sir. How far could you go inside? Oh, thousands of feet. But at that point, to be honest with you, it'd be cheaper for us just to go and look for a wet spot and dig it up because the ground will be wet if, if, the, if it's plugged. It'll come up. It doesn't take much at all. Every time you look at me like we're done, I should give another hand. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I think we've tiled, oh, geez, this winter we did out in California, um, south of Stockton. We actually have an office there. And then we have done down in El Paso, Texas, we've done about 5,000 acres of citrus farms. And North Carolina, we've done some potato stuff. We've got a lot of interest in Arkansas, um, Nebraska, Missouri, of course, Iowa, uh, Western Illinois. Minnesota, Wisconsin. Um, we've got more interest out in Washington State, Idaho. Um, so, and then actually in Maryland, we've got a number of projects lining up. But what people need to understand is North Dakota, we are massive farmers, right? And so we can do a lot of work in a short amount of time. And when you go to some of these areas like the Upper East Coast, their farms are 20 acres or 40 acres, right? A big one might be 40 acres. So it's like, we got to get a lot of, a lot of projects stacked up before we can start coming in and, and doing some of these to make it make sense for the mobilization. Did you have your hand raised? No. Right. Thanks, Levi. Thank you.